Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this very special evening. You are in for an incredible treat. Uh, my name is Anthony Arnov. I'm the editorial director of Haymarket Books. And we have the great privilege to be the publishers of Say Her Name, uh, which is the focus of this evening's program. Uh, our program features Kimberly Crenshaw with Dorothy Roberts, members of the Say Her Name Mothers Network, and in addition to the author talk, we'll have special performances this evening from Rosalind Coleman, Abby Dobson, Margaret Odette, and Kim Yancey, and then also a book signing after, organized by the brilliant independent bookseller here in Philadelphia, Uncle Bobby's. So please thank Uncle Bobby's and, and the Free Library of Philadelphia for hosting this event. Um, uh, we're so grateful to be here. Kimberly Crenshaw is the co-founder and executive director of the African American Policy Forum and the founder and executive director of the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at Columbia Law School. She is the Promise Institute Professor at UCLA Law School and the Isidore and Seville Salzbacher Professor at Columbia Law School. She's properly known for her development of intersectionality, critical race theory, and the Say Her Name campaign, and is the host of the podcast Intersectionality Matters and the moderator of the webinar series Under the Black Light. She is one of the most cited scholars in legal history. Crenshaw is the co-author of the new book, which is the subject of tonight's program, Say Her Name, Black Women's Stories of Police Violence and Public Silence, which features a foreword by Janelle Monet. Say Her Name provides an analytical framework for understanding black women's susceptibility to police brutality and state-sanctioned violence, and it explains how we can effectively mobilize various communities and empower them to advocate for racial justice. Founded in 1996, the African American Policy Forum is an innovative think tank that connects academics, activists, and policymakers to promote efforts to dismantle structural inequality. AAPF promotes frameworks and strategies that address a vision of racial justice that embraces the intersections of race, gender, class, and the array of barriers that disempower those who are marginalized in our society. You can visit their website at www.aapf.org. Kim Crenshaw will be in dialogue tonight with Dorothy Roberts. Roberts is the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor, the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology, and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mosell Alexander Professor of Civil Rights at University of Pennsylvania. She is also the founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society. An, an internationally acclaimed scholar, activist, and social critic, she has written and lectured extensively on the interplay of gender, race, and class in legal issues concerning reproduction, bioethics, and child welfare. Her latest book, which I can't recommend highly enough, Torn Apart is about how the child welfare system destroys black families and how abolition can build a safer world. Roberts is also the author of the classic Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, among other books, and has published more than 100 journals and essays in books and scholarly journals. Please welcome to the stage Dorothy Roberts. Beautiful audience. Thanks so much for coming out. And thank you for that warm welcome, Anthony. Well, I have the honor of serving as your MC tonight as we continue to the celebration of the release of Say Her Name, Black Women's Stories of Police Violence and Public Silence by Kimberly Crenshaw and the African American Policy Forum. Tonight, we're going to hear live readings of excerpts from the book, participate in a collective ritual of remembrance, and have an intimate conversation with the brilliant author, Kim Crenshaw, and members of the Say Her Name Mothers Network. This book is an extension 
of the Say Her Name campaign, which began back in 2014 with the goal of centering black women's experiences with state-sanctioned violence and police brutality. At the core of this work is the application of art, storytelling, testimonies, and ritual to highlight the names of black women, girls, and femmes whose lives were stolen from us. As the book describes, the birth of the movement takes us back to the site of a white coffin. And here to read her own words about the genesis of this campaign, we welcome to the stage the executive director of the African American Policy Forum, Kimberly Crenshaw. I'm standing in an air-conditioned auditorium thinking about Michelle Cousseau and the countless other black women killed by police whose deaths no one was paying attention to. My audience on this balmy spring day is mostly made up of public interest lawyers, students, and faculty. I'm remembering the courage that Michelle's mother, Fran Garrett, exhibited after Phoenix police killed Michelle in her own home. Michelle's story, like those of too many others, would have ended when Sergeant Percy Duprat stole her life had she not been born to a tenacious mother who refused to let her daughter's name be forgotten. Fran was determined that her daughter's life and death would not be reduced to obscurity, another statistic that no one counted. Michelle was killed just five days after a cop gunned down Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. After seeing the community protests taking shape there, Fran decided to march Michelle's casket to Phoenix City Hall. In this brave act of protest, she joined a powerful tradition of black women resisting and denouncing the state violence that directly threatens them and all too often destroys their families. Fran's march to the Phoenix City Hall was a flare in the night. Fran's radical act, literally placing her daughter's casket at the door of municipal power, not only demanded that Michelle be seen, but also rendered visible the police killings of other black women. The sorrowful procession of Michelle's coffin to City Hall left a searing image that spoke to the many ways in which black women's fate has been left in the hands of police, while their stories have been marginalized and sometimes erased. While Michael Brown's killing justifiably sparked a wave of nationwide protests, protests over lethal police shootings of black men, the killing of black women like Michelle had yet to be memorialized in widespread activations and denunciations. Fran offered a powerful and moving witness to the fact that black women were also losing their lives in circumstances that spoke to the disregard of black life and family bonds. There was no sound reason for their stories to be banished to the shadows of our collective consciousness, mere afterthoughts in the litany of savagery that has come to constitute anti-black state violence. Fran's act reminded us all of the obvious fact that slain women's mothers don't grieve for them any less, their children don't cry for them any less. Their siblings don't mourn them any less. And we should not protest their killings any less than we do the killings of their brothers, fathers, and sons. Six months later, as I look out at the audience, I wonder who among them will know Michelle Cousseau's name. Would they know of any other daughters who were stolen like Franz was? Or was the erasure of these horrific losses difficult to interrupt 
because of the reflexive ways that the very notion of anti-black police violence defaults almost exclusively to our endangered sons. To make the patterns of erasure visible and audible, I invite the audience to join me in something new. I ask those audience members who are able to do so to stand. I tell them, when you hear a name you don't recognize, take a seat and remain seated. I promise to invite the last person standing to tell the seated audience what they know about the person whose name no one else recognized. Then I call out the names slowly, deliberately, and loud enough for even those seated in the very back of the auditorium to hear. Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, Freddie Gray. I'm always a bit surprised when one or two people don't recognize even the first two names, but fewer than a handful have taken their seats by the time I lift up Freddie Gray. The vast majority of people recognize these men and know the common risks that link their fates. They are black and did not survive an encounter with the police. I pause for a moment. I ask the audience to look around. The room is quiet and still. People take in what they have demonstrated. Group literacy about the vulnerability of black people to police violence. At the moment, it seems a completely obvious reading of the social knowledge that is minimally necessary to ground any conceivable collective action. I continue. I say, Michelle Cousseau. And then comes that whoosh of dozens, sometimes hundreds, sometimes a thousand people taking their seats. It is the sound of silence. The sounds of people taking their seats mount as I continue the roll call. Tanisha Anderson, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Kayla Moore, India Kager, Shelley Fry, Corinne Gaines. One person is left standing after India Kager, but I continue anyway so people can hear more names. At last, I release the last person from any obligation to speak. I remind everyone that I'm a law professor after all, and I only say the last person standing will tell us something about the name they recognize to ensure everyone's honesty throughout the exercise. There are nervous titters as the last person takes their seat. This moment releases some of the tension in the room, yet the point still hangs over us. The silence about black women who've been killed by the police has distorted our collective capacity to respond. We cannot address a problem we cannot name, and we cannot name it if the stories of these women are not heard. Thank you, Kim, for that powerful reading from your book. A common thread that you'll find repeated again and again in our conversation tonight is how motherhood is never a protective shield against police violence for black women. Our children, too, are never protected from the horror of our deaths and the marking of our bodies as killable. We see this with the recent police killing of 21-year-old Takiya Young in Ohio back in September. Young was a pregnant woman and mother of two who was shot by a police officer through the front windshield of her car. We sadly see it again in the case of Miriam Carey, who was killed 10 years ago in Washington, D.C. 
On October 3rd, 2013, Miriam Carey drove through a police checkpoint that was not clearly marked in Washington, D.C., with her one-year-old daughter strapped in the car. Within just seven minutes, six Secret Service agents fired eight rounds in her car, and two Capitol Police officers shot nine rounds into her car. Miriam was declared dead shortly after arriving at the hospital. Luckily, her one-year-old daughter survived. Miriam did not fire any shots. She didn't even have a gun in her car. Here to read the words of Valerie Carey, Miriam's sister, please welcome artist and performer, Margaret Odette. My name is Valerie Carey. I'm the sister of Miriam Carey, and I'm a part of the hashtag Say Her Name Mothers Network. Miriam was a beautiful girl, a beautiful young lady. She wanted to be successful in life, and as she got older, she decided to go into the field of health, and she became a registered dental hygienist. I'm actually older than Miriam by seven years, and so there's a gap. I remember when she was a baby because she was so round and chubby. My father nicknamed her Butterball. And I guess my favorite memories really started to develop when she got older and when we would actually hang out more. That was my little sister. The day that Miriam was killed, it was a Thursday, October 3rd, 2013. I believe it was a Thursday. I was in my office preparing for an event I was hosting that evening with Terry Williams. And so I was just really trying to get my thoughts together, what I was going to say. I'm sitting at my desk, my laptop's open, and I use AOL. And so I saw on the main page there was a blurb about something happening in DC. I didn't click on it because I was busy. I was in my zone and I had a TV at the time in my office and I didn't have it on. And then my phone started to ring. It was a little after two. My phone just started ringing incessantly from different phone numbers. A lot of the phone numbers, I now know, were coming from the DC area. I actually picked up one of the calls because it was a Connecticut area code number. And at the time, my sister was living in Connecticut. She had just recently moved there and purchased a co-op. And so, I answered the call because I thought maybe it's my sister. I didn't know why all these calls were coming through, but they weren't registered in my phone, so I wasn't going to answer it. And when I answered, this one particular call, there was a man on the other line. He was a reporter. He asked to speak to me, and then he started asking me questions about Miriam. What type of car did she drive? Did I know where she was at? And, and I just stopped and said, I'm not sure where this line of questioning is going, but before I could finish, he said, well, apparently you haven't been watching the news. I need you to turn on your TV to CNN. And when I turned on the news, I saw what looked to be my sister's car. I saw what looked to be my niece being held by an officer. And there was a footer that read, suspect killed. Thank you, Margaret, for that powerful reading of Valerie's story of loss, survival, and remembrance. We honor the story of Miriam, 
and we will continue to uplift her name and aspirations. Valerie Carey, Miriam Carey's sister and a valued member of the Say Your Name Mothers Network will be joining us in conversation later. The Say Her Name Mothers Network is a community of mothers and family members of black women, girls, and femmes killed by police that works to provide support to mothers and families who also have been victimized by state violence. This community is in many ways a sisterhood of sorrow. They lean on one another for healing and support in what is otherwise a very isolating experience. It's through the solidarity of support and understanding that we also can come together to laugh, have moments of joy, and continue to advocate for change in law enforcement and communities across the nation. On August 1st, 2016, Maryland Baltimore County Police entered the home of Corin Gaines, a 23-year-old mother regarding unpaid traffic violations. Corin lived Corin live streamed the interaction with the cops in her apartment on social media. After Facebook agreed to cut her feed, the officer, Royce Ruby, fired into her home, killing her and injuring her five-year-old son. A jury later awarded Gaines's family a $37 million award for wrongful death. But that judgment was overturned by the trial judge, but then later reinstated on appeal. To read the words of Rhonda Dormius, Corin's mother, please welcome artist and performer Kim Yancey. My name is Rhonda Dormius. Corinne was my 23-year-old baby. Oh, she was a very, very feisty young lady from toddlerhood. Very outspoken, kind of bossy at times. But she was just matter of fact. Growing up, she did very well in school and excelled in all her classes. She went to a college prep high school called Baltimore City College High School, and she was interested in political science. During her senior year, she lost interest in political science because there were so many things going on in society that contradicted what she was being taught. Now, I think that was the beginning of her starting to reach out and learn more about the government outside of what was made available through the media. She wanted to go behind the scenes and do her own research. Oh, she was an avid reader. Oh my God, I would buy this girl 10 books in a week and she would go through them. She read urban novels, but she also read books about Marcus Garvey and other informative things. She graduated on time and she chose to go to Morgan State University. And she only stayed two semesters. And then she found out she was gonna have Cody. So I started looking at different colleges that would allow young mothers to have their children because I wanted her to stay in school. But then she was like, well, you know, that's, that's gonna be too much. So she directed her attention to her other passion. She got a cosmetology license and started doing hair and makeup. Oh, she enjoyed it. She bought two homes as rental properties that she used for income. She bought her own vehicle. She was independent. After Michael Brown, there was a whole snowball effect of police murders. Freddie Gray was a neighbor of ours. I didn't personally know him, but I knew him from the neighborhood, and it was literally a few blocks away. Everything that unfolded was literally around the corner from where she grew up. That was our community, and our community had been robbed. She was an activist role model. She wanted to teach because she was self-taught. She just wanted to enlighten the masses about things that were going on around her. She has a few spoken word poems that are out. 
Oh, she would always do her little rants on Facebook or Instagram about things that were going on in the world. Justice for Corinne. What does it look like? It looks like an officer shouldn't be allowed to make lateral moves within the department if they've had other issues. This was not Royce Ruby's first shooting. Justice for me is getting officers better training, making sure that they adhere to policy and not create new ones as they go along. The officer who shot Corinne was found not guilty because of the statues of such and such and such of the police code or this and that. They chose not to indict the officers. In September 2016, an internal police investigation concluded that Officer Ruby, who had previously been involved in a fatal shooting, was justified in shooting Corinne Gaines and would not be charged. He was subsequently promoted. We went to civil trial. It was February 2nd, 2018. It was four white jurors, two black jurors, who came up with their own settlement amount of $37 million. And they came up with that money based on the information that was presented from evidence. The county appealed. And on February 15th, 2019, the day before the anniversary of the settlement, the judge decided to overturn it based on qualified immunity which had been on the table three times before the trial even started. Well, he did that because he never expected us to win. He never argued for us to have qualified immunity because he didn't expect us to win based on the circumstances around the case. Once the jury heard all of the evidence, they came back with $37 million, the jurors. So that says a lot. Well, needless to say, we're going to appeal. Oh, it's not about the money. We have to get the truth out there. When they decided to decline criminal charges, oh, they thought we were going to go away. They want us to go away. I just want everybody to know that the fight continues. Oh, there is no dollar amount that can remotely replace what we have lost. Now, I can do without the dollars. I want accountability. I want the people involved to be held accountable. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and speak for all of us and say, I want them to pay. I want them to feel our pain. They need to know. They need to come from behind the wall of protection and be held accountable. That's, that's what I want. Corinne felt like she was in a fight by herself. So she would be so happy that I am continuing her fight in her last hours, she felt like she was alone. See, because that's the way the stage was set for her to feel alone. And I am going to continue battling for her because she had a message to get out. Now, it wasn't received by everyone in the way that she wanted to present it, but I am going to clear it up for her. I am going to clear it up for her. I am going to deliver it the way I know she would want it to be delivered. Thank you, Kim, for that fiery, fierce performance. Thank you so much. The fight continues. The fight continues. We have one more ex excerpt prepared for this evening. On September 15, 2015, India Kager was shot to death at a 7-Eleven gas station by the Virginia Peace Beach Police SWAT team, who threw flashbang grenades at her car while her four-month-old son, Roman, was in the back seat. India died shortly afterward. Roman survived, but he lost his hearing in his left ear from the effects of the flashbang grenade. 
Here are the words of Gina Best, mother of India Kager, read by artist and performer Rosalind Coleman. Someone asked me, Gina, are you always sad? And I'm like, yeah. And when I say sad, let me explain what I mean by that. You see the triggers on social media. Are you reliving this all the time? I'm like, I will never not live it. Never not live it. This is now a part of us. I hate the part of my life where I felt at one point that it wasn't, where I could not relate to someone having been killed by the police. For that, if anything has come out that I can hold on to after the murder of my daughter, I can look at another human, another mother or father or child and say, you know what? I do see you. And no one has the right to take your life because you're not in the right place. I don't believe any of our children were in the wrong place. Roman's birthday was May 11th. He's five now. He's got complete hearing loss in the left ear from the flashbang. He's disabled as well from the trauma. He's acting out. He's asking for me. He's really full of rage. He's waking up screaming in his sleep. He calls me Mima. I want Mima. I want Mima. Our children are traumatized for life. And once while his brother Evan was in bed, he said, Grandma. I see angels all around, and I'm like, yes, you do. So how I keep them alive, how I keep India alive, is with chimes, wind chimes. One is a butterfly, because I call all my granddaughters butterflies. And there's one just past the crystals, and there's one with crystals, just with sounds. I tell Evan every time he hears the chimes that it's his mommy coming by. She's always there, and he loves that. You've heard me say that I walk around with an amputated heart, and that is literally the case. Here is a bleeding heart. I envision that when we say her name, and we remember, we amplify our beautiful daughters and sisters and queens. I like to imagine India answering back. I like to imagine every last one of our babies, our loved ones, answering back. And I'll imagine a world where not only are we saying their names, but you are, are doing it too. And we're not speaking against the silence. Tell someone, speak their names. It emboldens us. It gives us strength and encouragement in the very lonely times because there are no words to articulate the level of pain that we live with. It's off the spectrum. But we're here. We're here. And we're going to do something about this, sisters. It's starting with us, and we won't quit. Wow. To borrow Gina's words so powerfully evoked by Rosalind, say her name is that something that sisters have done about this. Thank you to all three actors who so powerfully brought the evocative words of the book of Say Her Name, Mothers to Life. Thank you, Rosalind, Margaret, and Kim for those powerful performances. Now, please join me in re-welcoming to the stage Kimberly Crenshaw.
We're so glad that so many of you chose to come out and spend time with us this evening. An integral part of this book uh, has been to trace elements of state violence against black women to its odious roots in enslavement, when the bonds that black mothers had with their families were inhumanely and grotesquely disregarded and denied. This book is an exercise in bearing witness and being willing to sit with the cascade of emotions that come with bearing witness. In the excerpts from the mothers of Say Our Name in the book, we are angered by the contemptuous ways in which their loved ones' lives were stolen. We are shocked by the callous ways that a mother or a sister was informed or not informed about the brutal police killings of their loved ones. We are heartbroken to hear about the lifelong scars of the young children who witnessed the deaths of their mothers at the hands of police. We are frustrated by the compounding losses of institutional betrayal and communal abandonment experienced by the mothers and the sisters of the slain. Yet in the face of all of this, we are also uplifted by survivors' fearless advocacy for their sisters or their daughters in the aftermath of their deaths. We are privileged to see their lives through a special window into those little things that only the closest to them can invoke. We witness a magical moment of butterflies landing around a younger sister at Niagara Falls, a sister who was affectionately called Butterball by her father when she was a baby. We sit beside a mother reminiscing about how her daughter began writing on the wall at two years old, remarking that this was perhaps the beginning of her daughter's journey as a bohemian visual artist. This book has been written from many hearts and inspires to touch many more. The heart, we know, is more than a metaphor for love and loss. It is quite literally an organ that keeps us alive. Sadly, broken hearts exact a physical toll on the members of Say Her Name Mother's Network, some who we have lost due to stress related illnesses. We will always remember and honor the lives of Vicki Coles McAdory and Cassandra Johnson, both early members in our Say Her Name Mothers Network who worked tirelessly to raise awareness about police violence against black women. Vicki's niece, India Beatty, who she raised like a daughter, was killed by police in 2016. Cassandra Johnson's daughter, Tanisha Anderson, was killed by police in the family's front yard in 2014. And just months ago, our AAPF family mourned the loss of Amber Carr, sister of Atatiana Jefferson, and a dedicated member of our Say Her Name Mothers Network. Weeks before her death, Amber testified to the world about how much her family lost when her sister was killed by a Fort Worth police officer back in 2019 in the presence of Amber's seven-year-old son, Zion. We are reminded over and over again that when black women are killed by the police, when they are taken from this earth, the hole that is left in their absence is unfillable. For families like Amber's, Vicky's and Cassandra's, their grief endures, and too often it becomes deadly. It was a privilege to know these women in their life and an honor to commit the rest of our lives to saying the names of Say Her Name. Today we, today we are gathered at the Free Library of Philadelphia first established in the late 19th century as a library free to all at a time when all around the country, now, we are seeing the consequences of the erasure of our history, 
whether this is Governor DeSantis's attack against African American studies, or the new social studies standards in the same state where children will be taught that there were benefits to enslavement. We are also living in a time of an unprecedented number of book bans, particularly those that feature characters of color or speak about race or racism. These attacks against black studies, our history and literature are branches of the same tree, a tree whose roots are deeply rotten. Our hope with the publishing of Say Her Name, Black Women's Stories of Police Violence and Public Silence is to make the issue of police killings of black women a national conversation. And doing so at a time of rising censorship and attacks on black knowledge only motivates us to further our quest. First, families lose their loved ones to police violence and then the fact that they've lost them becomes lost to their communities, becomes lost to history, becomes lost to the movement. We need to ensure that our history and our lives are not forgotten or silence. And the first of many steps in that process is to say her name. And together with the Say Her Name Mothers Network, to remember the lives of the women who've been victims of state violence in this country. By bearing witness to their stories and sharing what you learned with your family and friends, you can play a critical role in breaking the ripples of silence surrounding the police killings of black women, and in doing so, turning the tide of racial injustice in this country once and for all. To do this, we welcome you to join us in our ritual of remembrance. During each Say Her Name gathering, we say the names of women, girls, and femmes who have been killed at the hands of police. On the anniversary of Say Her Name, we read every name. Last year, we read the names of 178 people. And to date, that number has unfortunately increased to close to 200. One of our phenomenal artists in residence, Abby Dotson, will now join us to sing a song that she wrote for the campaign. Please stand if you are able and join us as we remember some of the lives that have been lost.
say her name. India Kager, say her name. India say her name. India say her name. Corinne Gaines, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Michelle Cousseau, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Kayla Moore, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Shelly Frey, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Tanisha Anderson, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Michelle Shirley, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. A Tatiana Jefferson, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Miriam Carey, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Laylene Polanco, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Sandra Bland, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Brianna Taylor, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Pamela Turner, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Tarika Wilson, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Ayanna Stanley Jones, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. India Beatty, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Deborah Danner, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Rakia Boyd, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Catherine Johnston, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Alberta Spruill, say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. As you take your seats, Abby Dobson will bring us a song that captures our aspirations for a livable future. And I welcome back to the stage our MC, Dorothy Roberts. I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. I wish I could say all the things that I should say. Say them loud, say them clear for the whole round world to hear. I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart. Remove all 
of a bus that keep us apart I wish you could know how it feels to be me Then you see and agree that everyone should be free I wish I could give all I'm longing to give. I wish I could live like I'm longing to live. I wish I could do all the things that I should do. Though I'm way overdue, I'll be starting anew. Yeah, I wish I could be like a bird in the sky. How sweet it would be if I found I could fly. And look down at the sea And I'll sing cause I know Yeah, I'll sing cause I know Yeah, I'll sing cause I know How it feels to be free How it feels to be free how it feels to be free. Thank you. Until black women and girls are free. No one of us will be. Until black women and girls are free, no one of us will be. Until black women and girls are free, no one of us will be. Thank you. Wow, what a powerful, powerful offering that was, Abby. Yes, until black women and girls are free, none of us, no one can be free. Period. Yes, that is right. <laughs> now, we could wrap up with that, but we have more tonight to offer you. So to build on that powerful singing, build on the powerful testimonies we've heard tonight, I'd like to welcome, well, Kim is back on the stage. And we are going to discuss the book and the ritual that we were all part of. So thank you all for being here. Uh, before we get to the conversation, though, I'd like to invite you all, if you have questions, to write them on cards. Have the cards been provided already? OK. And uh, pass them back to an AAPF staff member who should be identifying themselves now. OK. Uh, and we'll, if we have time, hear those questions later. OK, so for now, I am going to join. So well, congratulations on a, just a remarkable program tonight based on a remarkable book. Thank you. Thank you and, so and much. All, all the work that Say Her Name has done. and. Uh, African-American Policy Forum also. Yes, yes. 
So uh, what was the process like curating these testimonies in your mm -hmm. book? Mm -hmm. uh, everything you all heard tonight came out of this book, these powerful testimonies of sisters and mothers of women murdered by state violence all came out of the Say Her Name book. Mm -hmm. And you put it all together. How was that? What was that like? What was that experience like? Well, first of all, um, I have to um, thank the mothers and the sisters of Say Her Name who were willing to trust us, mm -hmm. um, willing to allow us to listen um, to their conversations with each other, to um, be there for the moments when uh, remembering their loved ones um, was painful, and mm -hmm. also the moments where remembering, m remembering their loved ones brought them joy. Mm -hmm. um, the book is actually a compilation of the many moments that we have spent together. Uh, our mothers come together um, annually for Mother's Weekend in New York. We also um, bring them together for other events. And during that time, we always have opportunities to sit down and listen to the stories, the things that come back to them mm -hmm. um, about their loved ones, mm -hmm. um, the things that they're going through in the various cycles uh, of shock and of grief, mm -hmm. um, uh, the various moments when their demands for justice are either met or interrupted. Um, mm -hmm. And throughout this process, we would uh, ask them to uh, sometimes bring their loved ones in the room with them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How did their loved ones speak? Mm -hmm. What was their sense of humor? What were mm -hmm. some of the favorite things they liked to do? And sometimes we would interview mo the mothers and then the sisters mm -hmm. and say, we're going to have a conversation with you as your loved ones because we mm -hmm. want to paint a three-dimensional mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. um, uh, we want to know them for more than the worst thing that happened to them. Right, we right. want to be able to imagine the life that should have been. Yeah. And so a lot of uh, the interviewing, we started as we were writing a play uh, called the, uh, Say Her Name, The Lives That Should Have Been. Mm -hmm. So we've had multiple hours of talking with them and listening as they laughed and as they cried. Um, and those have been... Um, reduced to paper, mm -hmm. and they reviewed um, their interviews, and that became uh, the testimonies, the mm -hmm. tributes, the memories that are currently in the mm. book. Wow, that's, that's so beautiful. That was something I really appreciate about the book and the program tonight, is there was the recounting of the horror of the murder of these women, and holding the police accountable and the demands, but also stories about what these women were like, yeah. the yeah. memories, the fond memories. As you said, what yeah. could have been. What could have been. What could have been. You know, we, we started um, this process in 2015 mm -hmm. at the very first uh, protest rally, and one of the things we wanted to do was to have someone else bear witness to the worst thing that had happened because yeah. we didn't want the mothers and the family members to have to rehearse that repeatedly. Right. Yeah. Um, so in our, our first protest in Union Square, each mother was accompanied by someone who told a story about what happened, mm -hmm. someone else um, who uh, was able to uh, lift up what the what the family was currently going through, and yeah. then the family member would say what justice means to them. Yeah. And yeah. that has been a pattern um, yeah. that we have done throughout all of the Say Her Name uh, moments. Um, we were really uh, moved at um, one of our events at UCLA that we were able to bring uh, many artists there 
uh, to surprise the mothers. Uh, Abby curated uh, that wonderful evening, and it was one of the first times that they were able to hear back mm -hmm. um, how moving, how touching, how um, how how deeply. Um, uh, evocative their own words are of the kind yeah. of justice that they are looking for yeah. and so they um, the actors were able to embody it and they could see how moving their demands of justice are yeah. and so this is built from that moment yeah I love that idea of what are the family members demands for justice mm -hmm. which may not be and often is many not, times they're not the not same yeah the same or what the state says justice that's right. means yeah so it's it's so important to hear what we say justice is mm -hmm. for our loved ones mm -hmm. and for our communities yes. yeah i yeah. appreciate that the other thing i really appreciate is that you've created a place where the mothers and other family members sisters can come together and support each other mm -hmm which also isn't part of the regular so-called criminal justice yeah. system. And it, it, it actually, I mean, we, we've learned as we witnessed. Mm -hmm. um, our, our initial instinct was just bring everybody together who mm -hmm. wants to come mm -hmm. and let them tell us what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there, 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 have been, there have been moments that we've been privileged to, to witness that I think underscores how there's certain kinds of hurt that only people who've experienced it can touch. Yeah. Um, and there's there, there's certain permissions mm -hmm. to live life that mm -hmm. only other people mm. who've experienced the tragedy can give. Yeah. Um, so I um, one of our one of our moments we had. Um, uh, Vicky uh, Macadori, who I mentioned earlier, who's passed, um, she'd been grieving uh, India, her, her niece, who she raised as a daughter for some time. And um, we were we were all out to dinner. It was actually her birthday, mm. and and she was grieving at the moment, saying that India always said she was going to bring her to New York, mm -hmm. and and she didn't think it would be this way. Yeah. Um, so there was there was a moment of absolute heartbreak, mm -hmm. and then Vicky is one of the funniest per people we <laughs> ever knew, and then she just said something, and I don't even remember what it was, mm -hmm. but everyone cracked up, and right. then she cracked up, and then yeah. it became like this laughing fit, yeah. and it was such a relief yeah. and a release yeah. because, as they said, when we saw other people. Mm -hmm being able to continue to live, even mm -hmm. as they were grieving and right. even as they were demanding justice, they're still living life. Yeah. That gave them permission to open themselves up again yeah. to finding moments of joy, yeah. even in the face of tragedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you describe the public silence surrounding police killings of black women as conspiracies of silence and forms of dispassionate complacency. Can you walk us through what these terms mean and what we can do to end this complacency and silence? So I talk about this in terms of um, kind of um, collateral consequences that are acceptable. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. And by acceptable, I mean when there's silence in the face of it. Mm -hmm. When the, the killings don't fit within the available frames we have for understanding what anti-black racism looks like, mm -hmm. um, uh, the available frames for marking what anti-black state violence looks like, um, certain killings become illegible. Mm -hmm. The circumstances, the ability to say, oh, I know that story. If the story hasn't been told, then we don't know right. the story. We don't fill in the facts. We mm -hmm. don't say, oh, this is intolerable. And consequently, mm -hmm. we don't gather. We don't hold these families up mm -hmm. as families that have experienced something that we are collectively vulnerable to mm -hmm. and therefore invested in. And 
And that sends a message. That sends a message that we're not going to get um, angry about this. We're not going to march about this. We're not going to demand accountability about this. And when we don't demand that accountability, when we send the message, it also sends a message to the families. Yeah. We call it the loss of the loss. Yeah. Yes, there is the loss, but then when we don't speak to it, when we don't name them, when we don't demand accountability, we're basically saying that there's something that happened to your loved one that is exceptional mm -hmm. and it doesn't command our attention. Um, and it takes Gina, you know, to talk about it, um, which I'm sure she will in a moment. Um, but she, she talks about how people would say, basically, what did India do to get herself killed? Mm. Which is an engendering sure. of, of vulnerability to police violence that has all of the trappings of like rape culture, Absolutely. it's just kill culture. Yeah. You know, yeah. you put yourself in that situation either by uh, riding in a car with the father of your child um, or, you know, being in a home that, that is subject to rape. All of the ways that we have learned how rape culture makes women responsible for what happens to them, there is a parallel mm -hmm. that makes black women responsible for the things that happen mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. So bearing witness is the beginning of saying no to that collateral consequence being inconsequential. Yeah. You know, we We'll say we will not close our eyes to this. Mm -hmm. We will go through the emotions that are necessary to mm -hmm. say, no, you do not get to steal the lives of our loved ones. And yes, the engendering of anti-black violence is yeah. important. All the ways anti-black violence happens, not just with our sons. Yeah, yeah. Another big way in which this silence occurs and this kind of devaluation of violence against black women is the devaluation of black mothers in particular. And as we saw this evening, the fact that black women have their children with them is not a shield, yes. is not a shield. This is something that our work shares in common exactly. because just about every book I've written from Killing the Black Body to Torn Apart, yes. all about the devaluation of black mothers and what you were just saying about black women being blamed for being killed, we are also blamed for every harm that happens to our children. Including it's, them it's, killing it's, us. Exactly, it's, it's your fault that your children don't have the food they need yes. or housing. Yes. Uh, we're going to take them and put them in foster care right. because you're a neglectful mother. Or what I started my work was the prosecutions of black women. Absolutely. Absolutely. For all sorts of things who are pregnant and using drugs or it never happened to any other women. Yes. Never happened and in your US history. Your work um, has been foundational to filling out the question how can this happen to mothers, yes. especially in the company of their children, exactly. right? Yes. Everything happens to black women yes. in the company of their children. Yes. Black motherhood, as all of your work shows, has always been contested, yep. always been devalued, yeah. largely linking all the way back to the necessity of doing so in order to alienate, in order to commercialize, in order to treat black people as livestock. You've yes. got to treat mothering as something different exactly. when it involves black people exactly. than you do when it involves others. That's and so right. this is a continuation of that dynamic that has never been fully acknowledged no, or interrupted. Not at all, because those stereotypes are so deep, deep that we are innately dangerous to our children or neglectful to our children, and we have to get rid of those stereotypes. Now, part of how we're doing that is the black mother speaking out. Yes. Black mother speaking out. So I think this is a good segue yes. to bringing up 
the members of the Say Her Name Mothers Network, two members who are now both here. And so please extend a warm welcome to Valerie Carey, sister of Miriam Carey, and Gina Best, mother of India Fraser. As you can already see, the voices of these women is essential, essential to the book, to the project, to all of our work. I think that's something we share in common as well. Voices of black mothers have to be at the forefront. So first question to both of you, what was it like hearing your words so powerfully spoken on stage? So it was, it was an out of body experience <laughs> to hear someone else uh, speak my words. Um, it was saddening and mm -hmm. cathartic, mm -hmm. um, but necessary and appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the actors did such a good job of embodying <laughs> you, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, the inflection yeah. is as if she were in my office with me. Yeah. The way she spoke it. Yeah. Um, and we never spoke, so thank you for delivering the story the way yeah. you did. Yeah. Thank you. And Gina, you, I'm not sure if you were here, but you've heard before your words spoken. So maybe you can say what you feel about that. Ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. I know, settle <laughs> down. <laughs> it feels, is it Michael? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I've heard the actors, the sisters, speak the words of us and in our daughters as well. Mm -hmm. And to echo Valerie, um, Catharsis, and I want to just park that word for just a moment. Mm -hmm. Catharsis. We, for me, it feels collaborative in that someone has taken the time to get to know and to, for that very moment, to use your word, embody uh, the spirit of our loved ones who've been snatched away so viciously and with the most beyond vitriol, just their lives snuffed out. So it gets lonely when um, the silence is all that seems to be surrounding you. So I said I'm gonna park the word catharsis for a moment because in listening to Dr. Kim and my other sisters and the mothers, um, and I started thinking about why is it, and I'm, forgive me if I jump ahead, but why is it that this evil is, this, this crime, these re repetitive crimes are done against women, why is it that they're also trying to erase our history, erase us through the silence. I think of all of the whys. And one thing that I came up with is that, again, that word catharsis that my dear sister said but didn't know I was gonna go with this, is that they're trying to hide the feelings of what it's like. Again, babies in the car, our mm. daughters, how they must have felt is the bullets were piercing mm. their bodies, their flesh. I often like to think of that, I don't like it, but I do. And then also them trying to teach our children that we don't exist in terms of our history. Can you all hear me? Because I might just do something weird. Okay. <laughs> all right. Nonetheless. Um, so I wanted to share just this moment with you all before um, our sisters take back over catharsis. Catharsis is always in this book, our group, for those who've been victimized and our survivors, but not the perpetrators. And that seems to be what they're trying to do in the silence and trying to eliminate critical race theory. They don't want their children to feel what we feel every day mm -hmm. at their hands. Mm -hmm. So they're seeking catharsis by trying to ignore the deep evils and hate that mm -hmm. they've done to us for generations. Mm -hmm. Babies in the car. It's reminiscent of what our ancestor mothers went through. Their babies were snatched. The breeding farms. That's why this is so important what Dr. Kim has done in carving out the space, say her name. But she's also reclaimed what say her name means. It is for black women. 
black women killed by police. It's not to be co-opted by any and everyone to remember, don't get me wrong, I, we certainly understand in your grief and your pain, mm -hmm. but this is continual, mm -hmm. continual black women, which is why Dr. Kim had to carve out the space that she did. Catharsis is not for the perpetrators. And they're seeking catharsis by not teaching their children the evils that their ancestors have done and have done to our loved ones. Mm. You all can tell I'm, I'm, I'm angry. Mm -hmm. Thank Just, you. Thank you, Gina. Thanks, thanks, thanks Gina. Valerie, in the book, you speak about how your experience in the police force had prepared you to have the talk with your nephews to prepare them for the reality of anti-black violence, police violence. Can you share a little bit about how you came to consider that this is a conversation we have to have with black girls as well as boys? Yes, it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, as a retired NYPD sergeant, um, while I was on a job, I always uh, thought of my nephews as black men because unfortunately, um, their skin can seem to be a threat just in mm -hmm. itself alone. Mm -hmm. uh, never in a million years did I think that my sisters, whom were, are professionals in their own rights, mm -hmm. um, that they would ever be considered a threat not being in the act committing a mm -hmm. crime mm -hmm. or having a gun how is it that a woman with a baby in tow <laughs> driving is a threat that you feel the need to unload multiple guns mm. into her back, mm. in the back of her head? Mm -hmm. So it's no one is immune to police violence, obviously. Mm. Um, my sister wasn't immune to it. I wasn't immune to it because I was affected by it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, unfortunately, this is a conversation that's not just something that we have to speak to uh, with our boys, our men. Mm -hmm. It's something that we have to talk about with our sisters mm -hmm. and our aunts mm -hmm. and our mothers because they too can be affected uh, by police violence mm -hmm. because you never know what type of officer you're gonna encounter and what type of a uh, turn of events that he's going to create mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that can take your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So Kim, in what ways can we have a more expansive understanding of black vulnerability that implicates this gendered and intersectional way that black women are impacted by state violence? How can we expand our survival tools? And I think Valerie was speaking a bit to that already in ways that not only see black boys and men as being targets, but also black girls and women. Well, I, I think building on you know, what Val just said, first mm -hmm. of all, is just the recognition mm -hmm. um, that the risk is, is um, a risk of how our blackness has long been seen, framed, and interpreted um, as an indicator of, of potential danger. Mm -hmm. um, and gender does not arrest that. Right. right? Not, not for black women. So not That's for black for sure. women. Yeah. So there are pieces of this that we recognize and, and we know, we mm -hmm. understand you know, what happens when the purse clutch happens, mm -hmm. uh, when a black body is encountered. Um, mm -hmm. We know what happens when the elevator door opens and the people, you know, on the elevator see a black body and they jump. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know that. What we don't know is that um, being gendered as female does not provide protection mm -hmm. against that. Um, so it, it, it's very real um, that in many of the cases where black women do lose their lives, um, the context is often when the police have been called to help. That's right. And they and, yeah. encounter a, a black body 
that is never seen as a damsel in distress. Yes. Not seen as someone who is in fear. Mm -hmm. Not seen as someone who has needs, but mm -hmm. seen as Michelle Cousseau was, um, who didn't utter a word, right. but the police officer said that the look on her face right. yeah. gave him the sense that he and his half dozen police officers um, were at risk. Yeah. So just recognizing that we have only a part of the story about how, how blackness is um, and in, it, it is a risk factor mm -hmm. for generating uh, violence framed as defense of self or yeah. framed as defense of others. Mm -hmm. And then recognizing what that means in terms of the data. So black women are the group that is most likely to be unarmed when they are killed. <laughs> Of, of all um, diets. Mm -hmm. um, black women are less than 10% uh, of, of the female population. Mm -hmm. They are uh, more than 30% of those women who are killed. These are, um, these are significant disparities, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about them because the absolute number mm -hmm. is not as much um, as men who are killed. So it is right for us to be concerned about our fathers and sons or mm -hmm. brothers. There's nothing about this that is meant in any way to say that we don't have a huge problem. But yeah. it's also the case that the disparity between black women and other women is also a racialized vulnerability that we need to be able to speak to. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Gina, back to you. In the book, you describe how after India's life was stolen and what you call kill culture, that there was this additional layer of violence by justifying her death in the same way in which victims of rape have been blamed. And we talked a, a little bit about that already. Can you speak to how this is used not only to justify the deaths of black women, but also to suppress the outrage that these deaths should generate, but don't generate enough of. All right. I'll start by saying that most of us hold our mothers sacred and dear, most of us. If it's not a toxic relationship or narcissistic one, they hold our mothers safe and on a high pedestal, that's the first person that we know who gives us nourishment and tends to our needs. That is embedded in us, not only as children, but we remember that, earliest memory, okay? For most of us, or for those of you all who've been blessed to have good mothers, okay? The silence comes from, no matter what, and I don't know if this is the case, I'm just introducing something totally different. No matter what, if you're on a school ground, don't talk about my mama, it's gonna be a fight. Those are fighting words because you're talking about my mama. But very rarely is it my daddy. Okay, it's just part that. So it's the sacredness of the motherhood, which once again, Valerie, uh, Miriam was in the presence of her baby, her mm -hmm. daughter, and India was in the presence in front of her son, her mm -hmm. infant baby, sacred mothers. So the problem, and I'm gonna use this amalgamated, well, it's just layer upon layer mm -hmm. about the silence. Don't talk about my mom, but I'm wondering if, well, mothers are killed, we can't talk about them either, lest it happens to me, or whatever thought it is, there's something that I, I don't know that's holding, but we don't have, we'll defend our mama, but we're not defending our sisters who've been murdered by mm. Neanderthal police. I don't get it. And I'm sorry if I forgot the question. Um, well, th it, the question was just about your observation in the book that there is this layering of harm. First, the violence, the killing mm -hmm. of your loved one, but then the failure for there to be outrage over it in our communities as much as should be. As well, because our, our loved ones have been be. seen, right, as dishonorable. Again, it's the rape culture. It's the, she, they did something to bring this upon themselves. Mm -hmm. It is the assumption that 
no matter where you are, you have to be prim and proper and Miss Polly do right all the time. And if you're seen as anything contrary to that, you're trash. It is, again, the violation of the sacredness of being a mother or a sister or a daughter. It's the violation of, and I'm going to say this word, the divine feminine. The women are the ones. And we are birthing our children. We're raising them. We're doing the absolute best we can. With the, and being on a, you know, in this society, sometimes not secondary, but tertiary level in terms of how you're viewed. But when we're murdered, it's this deafening silence, particularly with black mm -hmm. women. And it hurts. I want you all to know that what Dr. Kim has put together is not just a group of obituaries. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, it, these are life stories. And I see you, one of my classmates, Roz, I love you, I see you. <laughs> okay, I just caught you. We went to Duke Ellington School of the Arts, where India went. <laughs> yes, you just caught that, okay. We were classmates. My daughter, India, went there. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. And she, and okay, oh, and, and oh, thank you. And you <laughs> had my baby tonight. So we were classmates, and we'll talk. Duke Ellington School of the Arts. I was there, Tony Terry, all of them, all of them. I will talk. Yeah. India went there as well. And you're talking about gifted women, women whose lives were valuable and precious, and yet we're seeing less than chattel. And what Dr. Kim was saying, they have to divorce themselves from even viewing us as human to even hold that trigger. Mm-hmm and pointed at the car with babies in yes, the car. Absolutely. When we got those calls, I'm going to divert to, to Val. Mm -hmm. Family, I want you all to know, to hear those words that your daughter's dead, she's been murdered. I'm thinking, and I'm ashamed of this, well, what happened? Was she doing something bad? First thought. And I'm ashamed of that. I carry that shame and I carry that pain, which is why when Dr. Kim coined the phrase, say her name, that was a year before India was murdered. I had heard it, but I heard it as applicable to Sandra Bland. Never in a million years would I think it would apply to my daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're fighting for their names to be amplified, their lives to be remembered. We're fighting for the laws in this nation to be changed. So the qualified immunity is not something they can hide behind with all of their other racist rhetoric and nonsense that they spew with their hatred that's then parroted in the media. This has to change. Mm -hmm. Because we can't tell you how much we love and miss our loved ones. Gone are the days of empty platitudes, family. We mm. need you to hear the pleading of us as loved ones. I'm going to give the mic to Valerie because I'm about to, you know, I'm just, this is so in us. It's, we cannot escape it or push pause or rewind. This is continual grief. Yes. And now it's intergenerational. They're killing black women, femmes, trans women, at, and no one is saying anything. Use your voice, please. Talk to your families, those who feel that they are not racist, they don't see color. How can you not see color? If you don't see that I'm black, you don't see me. <laughs> that's why we have to say her name. And that's why every woman in this book, and those who we don't know, and unfortunately those whose lives may be stolen at the hands of rogue police, every last one of our loved ones were killed by men. Every last one. Thank you for that, Gina. It's beyond Thank you. Every day. This is not yesterday or 2015, 2014. It's every single day. Time stops. And when we are forced to look at our lives from the moment our loved one was murdered, that's the date. Everything before then, who were we? And then afterwards, who are we? Because exactly. we're still mm -hmm. searching for that. And we have to live with this every day and then have to deal with, that's why, I, you know, I'm, the microaggressions, the, the, the just, just all of it. I'm sorry, let me let Doc. 
Um, you know, thank you all for being here. Just well, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think this, this is why we have to hear the voices of the people who are directly impacted by this violence because no one else could express it that way. And we're so grateful for your voices here tonight. So uh, we're going to turn now to the part where the audience gets to ask questions. And uh, Kevin has the cards and is going to read the questions for us. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dorothy, for that. And thank you to our mothers for joining us. We've got so many great insights and questions from the audience today. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to summarize some of the thoughts and just move into a final question uh, to take us out of the event. Um, folks have talked about what does it mean to dem demand accountability? What does accountability look like? Mm -hmm. um, people are making connections between legal scholarship. What does law, you know, have law professors here? What role does law have in combating what law often authorizes? Uh, people are reflecting back on both Gina and Val sharing stories about the children left in their families. What, what does it mean to witness this violence? And what does it mean um, to mm. continue to support these children? Mm -hmm. um, people are making connections with racist, violent projects happening within the Philadelphia community. Uh, evictions, um, mm -hmm. policies, legal policies which are affecting, which are all part of this nexus mm -hmm. of violence that impacts black women and communities of color. And people are lifting up intersectionality as a vital prism, a prism which is often being attempted to be unwritten in our laws um, at this moment in time. So thank you so much for your comments, and I know that everyone here appreciates them. Perhaps as just a lasting, um, last uh, reflection, um, which came from our audience as well, how do we continue to support the Sahane Mothers Network? Um, what can we, how can we do to continue to support this network, which has been um, a way to uplift these names, which are often erased. So thank you to everyone in the audience. Do you, yeah, do, do you want to answer that? Anybody, that member of the network here? Um, I would say to support the Say Her Name uh, campaign, support the works of AAPF. Uh, definitely buy the book. I would say have these conversations with your family. Um, and to see how you can become involved. You can become involved through volunteerism. You can donate. Um, and you can, if, I feel that we all have our own circle of influence. We all are influencers. You don't know who you can touch and how you can lift your voice to help amplify our voices. Mm -hmm. um, so many, <clears throat> so many different um, uh, thoughts. Um, so trying to stay focused on the question, I, I would say um, one of the aspects of, of the artivism that we do is often to try to capture what remains illegible um, to uh, train the kind of thinking that we would have to engage in in order to look for the stories that our dominant narratives don't tell us about. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the 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 uh, t-shirts, the sweatshirts that represent say her name, um, they look like word puzzles. They're actually the names of black women who have been killed by police, mm -hmm. and we use that graphic to indicate what has to be done. Most people don't want to ignore, they don't want to marginalize, but they don't know what they don't know. Uh, so this is basically to say, you're gonna have to work at it because our media don't have the frames to elevate what happens uh, to black women and, and many people at the margins. Many of our movements are focused in a unidimensional way they aren't able to really speak to the intersections of vulnerability. Our histories don't tell us what the consequences of that erasure has been over time. We have been talking about 
uh, state-sanctioned violence against black women. Of course, it's connected to other forms of violence against black women, and we, do, we don't have a history of how black women have fought against this over time, and because we don't have that, when there are important historical moments mm -hmm. that come up and that legibility becomes absolutely essential to our survival as a people, mm -hmm. we miss the mark. <laughs> That's what happened when Anita Hill showed up talking about sexual harassment, mm -hmm. and people said, what is that, and why is a black woman talking about that, not knowing black women invented sexual harassment <laughs> as right. a way of That's true. Uh, addressing yeah how the kind of sexual abuse that we experienced since we arrived in these shores <laughs> was rationalized. Mm -hmm. So because we don't know that history, we don't know about Rosa Parks, we mm -hmm. don't know that she fought as a rape crisis <laughs> person. She's a person who came into politics defending black women who've been sexually abused. Because mm -hmm. we don't know that, we think that these issues around women are separate from the issues around anti-racism. Mm -hmm. And so when people say, why should we use intersectionality anymore? It's been undermined. It's not useful as the college board did. You see, I feel a way about it. <laughs> this is what intersectionality helps us see, what we would ordinarily miss. Right. So exactly. I, I would encourage greater legibility, greater effort to read between the cracks, see what is falling mm -hmm. out of our, 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 our partial education, <laughs> out of the partial ways that we advocate, out of our, our, our inability to see how social disempowerment is reinforced across race, gender, class, sexuality, all the different ways um, that we have not fully been present for each other. Mm -hmm. So that that is, the, you know, say her name is the embodiment. And mm -hmm. a lot of people say, what is intersectionality? Read what these, what these <laughs> mothers have to say. Mm -hmm. It's not some highfalutin theory. It's the way our lives have been structured. Right. And it's the kind of knowledge we need to do in order to create transformative possibilities. That's right. That's right. Well, I think that is a powerful word to close our program on tonight. Thank you so much for those closing remarks. And I want to give some thanks now. Special thanks to Valerie and Gina for joining us tonight. <laughs> yes, thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for continuing to fight for justice. Thank you for being an inspiration to us. Thank, thank you. you. And so I just want to um, say thank you to my daughter who came oh, out. Wow. She was um, Miriam's first niece. And um, stand, up. stand up, Shelby. <laughs> thank you. Okay, special thanks also to Anthony Arnov. Is he still here? Who opened our program today? Oh, there he, oh, he's hiding behind the camera. I couldn't. <laughs> okay, there you are. Thank you so much from Haymarket Books, which published this book, for being here, for opening us up and the warm welcome you gave us today. Thank you. A uh, special thanks to our wonderful actors today and your powerful performances. Yes, Rosalind Coleman, Margaret Odette, and Kim Yancey. Thank you for those just magnificent, uh, mind-blowing performances. And uh, Abby Dobson for your rendition, your offering, uh, just off the charts, off the charts. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim, I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this special program, sacred program. It's been an honor and a treat to be part of this. Uh, just unbelievable. And, and, and let me thank, I call Dorothy my sister-in-law, <laughs> uh, in-law. Whenever we get together, we, you know, we just go there, there with we're, each we're other. Smoking, so thank yeah. you so oh, much, sure. my, my pleasure, <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you to the whole team 
at free, the Free Library of Philadelphia that's hosting us tonight, and the entire team at AAPF for all its creativity and hard work that brought all this together. And then thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. And we hope that you are going to take back with you what you learned tonight at a call for action. Tell people about this. As Valerie said, you can find out more about APF. You can read the book. You can tell your friends and family. Uh, there's a lot you could do, so please do that. Learn more about how to be part of this campaign. Uh, you can visit AAPF at aapf.org backslash say her name, uh, where you can take steps to become part of the campaign and advocate and stand up uh, for this campaign. And you can participate in upcoming events such as the Na ninth annual Say Her Name anniversary on December 14th. So finally, you can pick up a copy of the book Say Her Name on your way out and have it signed by these illustrious, uh, wonderful women right here who were the stars of this program tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much, and good night.